Hi, and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Today, we have a special sponsored episode from Griffles. Our guest is Dr. Tommy Ardiles. He's a pulmonary critical care physician, and he's a pulmonary medical director at Griffles. Today's topic, understanding alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, what you need to know. Find out more at kevinmd.com slash alpha. That's kevinmd.com slash alpha, and that link will also be in the show notes. Dr. Ardiles, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start by briefly sharing your story and journey that led you to where you are today. Right. As a pulmonologist, you know, we all start to gravitate to an area of, of injuries, right? And in my case, I always gravitated to the airway disease patients, right? I, I found that asthma and COPD are, are very interesting diseases that we have made quite a bit of progress over time. And, you know, taking care of very advanced disease and patients with COPD naturally led me to start finding patients with alpha-1. And, and that's how I started learning and, and realizing that there is quite a bit of potential of, of that we can do for the patients with alpha-1 and COPD. And for our listeners who might not be familiar, what exactly is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is it's a genetic disease, right? You are born with this. There's nothing you've done wrong or you, or you chose by yourself. And the way it makes you sick is that if you have the deficiency, your body does not have the genes to make a particular protein it's called alpha-1. So when your body cannot make enough alpha-1, it is susceptible to certain inflammatory insults, right? I, I always said example, like if you hit your ankle against the curb, it will naturally swell up, but at some point inflammation does stop, right? So our body has a way to regulate inflammation and alpha-1 is our body's natural anti-inflammatory. So if you put that into the lungs, for instance, right? If you get a cold and you don't have a way to stop the damage from a cold, it could be a much, much more exaggerated damage if you don't have a way to stop that. And why is it important for people to be aware of and think about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? So when we look at a disease, as you know, it's usually a, a combination of uh, both your genetic predisposition and your environmental factors, right? So if you don't know that you are at risk or you have alpha-1 deficiency, you really don't have the complete picture, right? So if you're a pulmonary patient, and you just don't respond to treatment or you realize that, you know what, everybody in my family is sick. So what are we missing here? Right. So it would give you the complete picture of, of your disease. What are the common characteristics or signs that an alpha one patient might exhibit? This is a, a, a very good question on what leads to, to the need of to have this conversation, right? I think one of the myths of alpha-1, and, and, and you know this by what the little we get taught in medical school, right? Oh, I can spot an alpha patient if I see one. Well, that really isn't true, right? We, we know that alpha patients present like any other patient with COPD or asthma, right? A lot of them are told they have asthma as a child and because they start having respiratory symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, cough, flare-ups, they don't get well after a cold and they start developing lung disease. So the symptoms really overlap very much to what we know of other lung diseases like asthma and COPD. So it's really hard to distinguish it unless you test for it. And how is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency tested or screened for? So as we mentioned earlier, it is a genetic disease. So we have to find either the defective gene or the consequences of the defective gene, right? So there's mainly three ways to test for it. Finding the protein that the gene uh, codes for it or the mm -hmm. gene makes, it would be checking for an alpha-1 level, right? So that's one way to test for it. Another way to test for it is to actually test for the protein itself to look in what we call the phenotype. And that is a technique that's a little more complicated to do, but it can be done. And this, there's another way which we advocate for because it's a little more accurate is to look for the genotype, is to actually 
look for the specific defective genes for the disease. And who should consider getting screened for alpha-1? So as I was saying before, most important is to recognize that patients with COPD or refractory asthma, or you know, the asthmatic that's just not doing well, can have alpha-1 deficiency, right? So most professional organizations like the American Thoracic Society, the COPD Foundation, they recommend that all patients with COPD should be screened for alpha-1 and all the patients with refractory asthma, right? Your asthmatic that just doesn't do well, doesn't respond well to treatment, or patients that have persistent obstruction on the pulmonary function test, or family members with alpha-1. All those patients should be screened. And what are the typical costs associated with testing for alpha-1? So typically, the if there is a, a patient with symptoms and, and there is the indication to screen, most insurances will cover the cost of screening through commercial tests. So there's, you know, it, it might be, you know, you know, the complexity of our care, they may be billed to the patient or, or, or whatnot, but so some insurances will, will, will cover the, the testing for it. But there's one alternative that we can offer, which is a uh, screening test in which we can test for your genotype through our Alpha ID program. So, I'm a primary care physician, as you know, so give us a picture of a typical patient in my exam room that may trigger me to think of alpha-1. What would a, a typical patient look like? Right. So we are um, trained to think of the, you know, your typical patient would be the patient who is younger with advanced lung disease, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the, the when if if I could show you a, a picture of how scattered they are in in the in the disease spectrum and the pulmonary function test, so that's why the one of the myths that we say is that you can't really spot an alpha one when you see one. That's why uh, we'd really recommend screen all patients for CO, that have COPD because you really can't spot one when you see one, and it becomes a part of your routine. You know, it's a box to check. You know. You're listening to a special sponsored episode by Griffalls on understanding alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, what you need to know. Find out more at kevinmd.com slash alpha. That's kevinmd.com slash alpha. The link will also be in the show notes. Now, once tested, who has access to the results of an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency test? So if you go through our program for our Alpha ID kit, uh, the results are strictly confidential and they're only available to you and, and your physician. And how many alleles are typically screened for in Alpha 1 testing? So this is a very interesting question because, you know, when I, I trained and I, I only learn about the, the classic ones, right? The, the, the S and the Zs and so, most commercial places that are not specialized in this will test for the most common alleles, which would be the normal M, the S variant, and the Z variant, right? And we've learned now that there are a lot more alleles, so mm -hmm. we can really have a, a more comprehensive evaluation when we test for more alleles. And what are the benefits of screening for all 14 alleles related to alpha-1? So... As I was saying, the, the as the, the more we look, the more we found. So we have been screening for uh, a long time. Our screening program in the U.S. has over a million patients that have been screened, and we're seeing that uh, about fifteen percent of people have an abnormal allele. And obviously, not all of them have severe disease. But the the uh, another interesting thing that we're seeing is that. Since we have identified what we call rare alleles, which is the, the 14, uh, we are finding more and more patients, right? So the accuracy of diagnosis increases significantly by checking for all the potential variants. And why is it important to look at genotype versus serum levels when assessing for alpha-1? Right. So the serum levels of alpha-1 uh, tend to go up and down. Hmm. So if you get sick, your levels naturally go up because it's what we call an acute phase reactant, right? So 
if you are not feeling well or you or you have a cold, you may have a slightly increased level and you may think that somebody doesn't have a real deficiency and you may miss somebody that that has deficiency just because you you caught them in, in when they were sick and and also if you have a, a level that doesn't appear to be significantly abnormally low right you may miss the opportunity to identify that person and also that and find one person also helps you follow up with their families as well right so there might be implications for the family by by missing a diagnosis and what is the significance of knowing that someone has alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency i i personally think that it completes the picture right you no, you you now know that you have a genetic predisposition to to get sick, right? That your lungs is the organ that gets primarily affected, right? So, let's say we screen somebody and we find that they they have a they are a carrier or they have the disease, and then they realize, you know what? I all my children smoke, right? Mm -hmm. And then that person convinces them to get tested, and they all get tested, and they also realize, oh, I carry the gene too. The chances of all those three quitting smoking just went up through the roof because we know from studies and also psychologically those people know, you know, I, I am predisposed to have lung problems, right? So the motivation to have lifestyle changes increases. And given how rare alpha-1 is, why is widespread screening still so recommended? Mm -hmm. And maybe a, a better way to to... As the question would be to say widespread of all our patients with COPD, right? Because it's one of the things that when you screen somebody, let's say for colon cancer, right? You you send for a colonoscopy, really hoping they don't have colon cancer, right? Yeah. But but you know it was the right thing to do, right? Check the box, you're good. Let's see what happens in 10 years or or whatever period is appropriate, right? So I think it's important to to know that the person, your patient with COPD or with refractory asthma does not have a genetic predisposition, right? It's it's following guidelines and recommendations, right? So once a patient is diagnosed with alpha-1, just in general, talk to us about the treatment options that are available and if patients who have died, when do all of these patients, do they require treatment? Yeah, so I think once a patient has has alpha one, and 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 they need to be obviously seen by by somebody with with expertise, and then they need to see if they qualify for treatment, right? And the treatment is is complementary to the treatment of their uh, underlying COPD, right? So you have somebody with COPD, they need to continue the treatment with COPD for COPD. I'm sorry, but. If they also have a severe deficiency and you see that they have, you know, emphysema, mm -hmm. they would qualify for what we call augmentation therapy. And in terms of these type of treatments, are you looking for an academic medical center? Do most community pulmonologists offer treatment for alpha-1? So a great resource to get connected to an alpha-1 especially is, is through the Alpha-1 Foundation. They sponsored what we call CRCs, which are academics, uh, sorry, uh, centers of excellence. So if you go into their website, you can find the CRC that's closest to your region, or you can find a specialist that, that treats with alpha one. And let's end with some of your take home messages that you'd like to leave with the Kevin and the audience. Yes. Thank you again. I would like to say that Alpha one is not as rare as we think it is, right? We, we we like to say that it's rarely diagnosed. And I would plead with the audience that if you have patients with COPD or refractory asthma, just test for them, right? Testing is easy. It's it's very available. And just check that box, right? Every guideline tells you to do it. Your patient will appreciate to know that you are essentially, you know turning every stone to understand their disease, right? So test for them, know if they have that genetic predisposition or not. And then, you know, you. I think everybody uh, will feel better caring for the patient in a, in a better way, right? You've listened to a special sponsored episode by Griffles on understanding alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, what you need to know. Find out more at kevinmd.com slash alpha. That's kevinmd.com slash alpha. And the link will also be in the show notes. 
Dr. Ardiles, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me.